All right, let's go in our Bible here this morning, Isaiah chapter 6. We have a lot to get through, so bear with me here as I try to do my best for you. We are going to compare today another problem that is relevant in the church for us as believers. And there are many uh, voices, the Bible says. There's many uh, sounds we need to be able to discern. We need to be able to... uh, know what truth is. We need to be careful that we don't follow the Pied Pipers of our day and just do anything and everything to grow a church. It is uh, very evident today that the church growth movement is working. Amen. The church growth movement is working. Uh, There have been uh, great strides over the last 70 years um, to implement philosophies to implement uh, studies that what can we do, if you would, to make the church grow? Much of the emphasis has been put on what can we do to appeal to the unchurched that they would feel that the church is relevant in their life, they would feel comfortable as they walk through the door, and they would want to stay in the church. Now, it's the truth to be known. This time of the year, a lot of family going to get together. And, you know, from time to time, somebody invites someone to be with them and their families. As much as you would try to make that person feel welcome and to feel, you know, part of your family, they're not part of your family. And so the same thing is with, uh, you know, God and His family. Those people outside of Christ are not part of the family of God. And so when a lost person comes into the church, yes, they should know that someone loves them, someone cares for them, that truth can be found here, that there's an answer to their problems. The Bible is relevant, but it is not our job as a church to make the church appealing to the world that the world would come in and say, this is what I need in my life. Our job is to preach the gospel, to preach the word of God in its entirety and truth and not compromise those things that make people feel uncomfortable that don't, um, uh, if you would, uh, don't uh, offend them. That's not what we're supposed to do. In fact, we find here in Isaiah chapter 9 or 6 that God was not concerned with results. Now, I know that surprises you this morning, and it should surprise us because we think success is results. No, success is obedience to God. The Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 8, For this this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on this that thou mayest uh, prosper, thou mayest find good success. Look at that, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. I want to show you just a a little bit of a comparison. I I know we went to Isaiah, so just just hold your hand there. We're going to be back or put a bookmark or a pen there. Go back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Look at God's definition of success in the church and God's definition of success in the life of His people. Prosperity. Prosperity is not necessarily building the biggest church with the greatest congregation. Yes, I'd love to see that here in this place. But Joshua chapter 1 says, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Our business in the church is not to build some great organization and keep this thing running. Uh, One man was telling me he was part of a church and he knew he was in the wrong church when they were having a board meeting. And one of the discussions at hand was, can we take out an insurance policy in case something happens to the pastor so that we can have the money to keep the business aspect of the church going on. In other words, they were borrowing money considering buying a policy because the church was so great and there was so much business financially going on at one time that they were afraid if something happened to the pastor that they wouldn't be able to financially continue to do the things that they're doing. So they took out an insurance policy against the pastor not being the pastor anymore because they thought if he leaves, everybody else is going to leave. We won't be able to keep this thing running. And the guy who told me this just here recently, he said, that's when I figured out I'm in the wrong church here. 
I mean, it's really nice. We're doing great things here, but come on, when you're taking out an insurance policy to keep this big business going, something's wrong here, friend. What about trusting God? What about believing that God will provide for the church? And so uh, it's very interesting to think about that. So for, again, what is God's definition of success and prosperity? Doing and keeping His Word, meditating on His Word. So I wanted to talk about this word very quickly, Isaiah chapter 6. And as you turn there, think about this. Does God look on a people and God look on a church and say, that's a great church if they've done great things? Well, remember, God's definition of greatness is not ours. God's definition of success is not ours. God's definition of prosperity is not ours. Isaiah chapter 6, you're going to find a man named Isaiah called of God to preach his word, called of God to go out and speak faithfully, thus saith the Lord, and he surrendered to that call in verse 8 and says, I'll go, here am I, send me. Verse 8, God said, who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Verse 9, this is what God said. He said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but not perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now Isaiah said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. What? Go preach my word, do exactly what I have for you to do, and there's going to be minimal results of your preaching, Isaiah. And he said, I'll go, Lord. We see often again that in the word of God, God does not use man's comparative ways of determining what is prosperous, what is success, and what is, um, if you would, great results. God's results are different. You know, it's important that we preach faithfully. Would you go with me here in Romans chapter 1? Romans chapter 1. And uh, we're also going to read 1 Corinthians here in a moment. But the idea here, Paul knew the church growth movement was not based on man's philosophies and man's ideas and man's ways, but simply the Word of God. Just preach the Word of God. Let the Lord take care of the results. Romans chapter 1, it's not to say that we can't learn some new things and figure out some new ways. We don't want to just say we can't do anything new, but we don't need to follow everything that's new. We don't need to... Uh, met several years ago, there was great conferences and great big places you could go and you could learn how to grow your church. And it's always the same thing. Minimize hard preaching. Don't talk about hell. Don't talk about sin. Do what you can. Have entertainment. Get some comedians in there. Uh, get some messages that help to deal with the felt needs of people. Deal with their emotional lives instead of their spiritual lives. It's very easy to pervert the gospel and make it seem as if it's here to just help us in the emotional aspect instead of the spiritual aspect. You have to reach people and you have to give them basically what they want instead of what they need. And God help us to never be like that. Romans chapter 1, Paul said it this way in verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was ready to preach. That's what we must do. We must preach and teach the Word of God. We, we're we not uh, wanting to do pipe uh, this psychology, pop psychology, if you would, where it's just, you know, saying things that are pleasing, inspiring stories. I, I, it was one of the, David Jeremiah is one of the greatest preachers, I think. He has one of the great oratory abilities to preach the Word of God. But he said to the other day, I was listening to him on the radio, and he said, just put your Bible down and listen to me read this for a moment. I thought, man, that troubles me when a man thinks like that. And if you listen to his preaching, he has one story after another, after another, after another, after another, and it's just sort of like it's just sprinkled with a little bit of God's Word that's left over after all his wonderful motivational stories. And I wonder, I, I have to say, even though he has a great ability to, and he's a great orator, I wonder... Would to God that he would focus on the Word of God. And, and I'm troubled when somebody says, close your Bible, just listen to me for a minute. That troubles me greatly. Uh, and it should trouble any Christian that loves the Lord. 
But the Bible tells us that, that in the last days there would be people that have what? Itching ears. Let's look at that verse here today in 1 Timothy, if you would. Itching ears. And we'll see that. We'll see that. Uh, Timothy, if you would. I believe it's 2 Timothy. Let's, let's go there. Sort of getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I guess we only have so much time to talk about this today. Uh, see if we can put our ear on that. I believe it's 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, maybe? Chapter 4, please. Here it is. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. It is funny. I write all this down, and I try to circle it and put it in my notes, and then I can't find it when I want to look down at it here on my notes. So thankfully, I've read this verse enough to be able to find it for you. 2 Timothy 4. Look what God told Timothy here. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. It's God's word. It's the gospel. It's the word of God. He says, be instant in season, out of season. And here's this word, reprove. Reprove. That's the things that people don't like. How many of you like to be told today that you're a sinner? No way. How many of you like to be told you're wrong? No way. But we need that in our life, lest our hearts become hardened and we walk away from God. Or in the sinner's case, unless a sinner never comes to God because he thinks he's all okay. Everything's just all right. And um, again, he says, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. doctrine. So two negatives there, guys, reprove and rebuke. In order to reprove, you have to open your Bible and read it. We are reproof, reproving the Word of God. What is truth? What is doctrine? You have to open your Bible. You have to preach your Bible if you're going to have reproof. And it says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They would rather hear a good story than to hear the word of God. One man attended our church uh, several months ago, and he said, I like the fact that you spend so much time in your Bible. I like the fact that I'm turning my Bible constantly to read things. He said, most preachers will start at a text and they'll just stay there and preach just that text. He said, I like the fact that you go through the Bible and go through and find this verse and that verse and put it all together. That's a good thing to be comp uh, co uh, complimented for. And can I say something else? It's also a good thing to be accused of. You guys, you, you're way too much Bible. I can't handle all that. One lady attended our service and she said, I heard more scripture in the first Sunday school lesson than I've heard all year in my church, the other church that I went to, in one Sunday school lesson. And she hasn't been back. Now, I'm not saying anything against her, but maybe that was more than she could handle. <laughs> it was just too much scripture. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it really shows people, and again, it's not, I'm not taking anything personal. Uh, you know, I, I thought about something the other day. When we get a visitor in this church, I always just stand from this pulpit and say, look, if you're here to be impressed, if you're here to be pleased, if you're here to be uh, just always encouraged, please, you're in the wrong church. But if you're here to wor hear the Word of God and here to hear what God puts on my heart to say to you, then you're in the right place. And if that's fine, if we only have a couple people here, then that's God's will. Um, I'm not going to change my message thinking, will this be pleasing to so-and-so? Will this be entertaining? Will I be able to keep someone's attention as they come? And of course, I, my goal and desire as a pastor is certainly to keep your attention and to, to you know, infuse God's Word into your life and make a difference in your life and, yes, be relevant. But ultimately, it's I want to say, thus saith the Lord. I want to preach what God puts on my heart, even if it causes someone who's been my friend for years to say, I can't believe you said that. Because at the end of the day, that is our job as a local New Testament church is to preach the word and to be instant in season and out of season, reproving and rebuking. It always amuses me when someone comes up to me and says, you were talking about me. You were preaching to me. That really cracks me up. Because just in the first, when prayer starts at church, they'll say, 
Lord, speak to my heart. Lord, give me something today. And then you preach, and God puts something on your heart to say, and you don't even know who it's for all the time. You just preach it. I went away from here last week, and I, it was Monday, and I went, oh, God, that was for me. You knew I needed that. You were speaking to my heart. And, you know, God's doing that, and God wants to do that. He doesn't want to entertain people. Yes, church can be a place of excitement, but this is not give the customer what he wants. This is not a marketing campaign that says whatever the person wants, that's what we should have for him here, whatever makes him happy. No, it should never be that way. Sometimes we should leave church saying, man, I, I need to get some things right with the Lord. Amen. I, I needed that. Uh, we should never poll the audience. I, I'll, you're never going to get a thing from me that says, what do you think you, I should preach on next week? I'm not going to do it. Amen. I'm not going to do it. Uh, now I'm not, I mean, it's okay if you tell me, hey, Paul, you need to work on this. Or, hey, you, I had a lady come to me and say, would you please stop saying just one more verse or you're almost done? Just preach, and when you're done, be quiet and pray. And I'm like, oh, that's good advice. I like that, that kind of criticism. Amen. Um, so anyway, um, do we know, by the way, the church is primarily for believers? Are we understanding that truth this morning? It is not for the lost to come in here. The church, yes, if a, a lost person comes in here today, we're going to do our best to evangelize, to preach the gospel to them. But the church's primary need, I should say the primary objective, listen, is not to please men. It is to please God. It is to please God. And that's why, you know, over the years I've gotten a little bit harder in the sense of thick skin, when somebody comes up to me and says, you don't make me very happy, or I'm mad at you. Listen, I didn't do it with the intent to hurt you. I preach what I preach because God puts it on my heart. Amen. Christians should have the desire, and our church as a whole should have a desire to say, Lord, we want to be pleasing to you in this place. And if there are other people that love you, and we're doing what we're supposed to do as we love you, then God, you'll make them part of us here in this church, if it's your will. And we're not going to, again... Um, tear down the walls, and just build bridges to everyone. That's a big theology, build a bridge to everyone, amen? Just do what you can to reach people. Um, much of what's going on is no longer sermons, rather it's talks. Short, simple, humorous, uplifting, and personally expi inspiring. Relational instead of doctrinal. Don't deal with immorality, don't deal with sin, don't deal with guilt. And... Unfortunately, many people will, again, churches will change their format or change what they're doing to be appealing, change their message, compromise truth in order to gather a larger audience. That's often happening. And Pastor Grove used to say this, and I'll never forget it, and just burn it into your heart, guys. It's not what they say that makes them false prophets and preaching false doctrine. It's what they don't say that proves that they are preaching false doctrine and they're false prophets. When their message can appeal to anyone on any level and it makes everyone feel like they're God's children and everyone's going to heaven, you know they're not God's people and you know they're not preaching God's message. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what the Bible says the world thinks of our message and, and what we are doing in this place. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And again, we don't have to have a bad spirit. We don't have to go around telling everyone... You're going to burn, sinner, burn, sizzle, sizzle like bacon. We, we, we don't want to have that attitude. But on the other hand, we don't want to treat everyone as if they're all God's children and everything's all right and, you know, it's all going to be happily ever after. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Bible says, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words. Did you get that? Man. There is a lot of good philosophical and wise preaching going on today. And you know what? It's not the Word of God. The Bible says, Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but as to us which are saved, it is the power of God. According to 1 Corinthians 2.5, Paul said it this way. Here's why. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When I preach the simplicity of the gospel and the, the just simple gospel truth, my daughter came forward to get saved that day. And you know what it was? It was the power of God. It wasn't a fancy story. It wasn't a wonderful antidote or an example. It was the Word of God that brought salvation into her life. 
and so it was in all of us. I mean, consider a church bringing wrestling into their church. Oh, yes, here it is, actually, a one. I've seen churches, Super Bowl, let's come to church Sunday night and watch the Super Bowl together. That's a way to bring the lost into the church, and perhaps we can build a bridge and we can see them get saved. It's not saying that we can't have fun in the church or have fellowship from time to time. It's just the idea that we should never replace God and His Word with things of the world to try to appeal. Yes, we're responsible with the message of the cross. Yes, we're responsible to evangelize the world. But Christians should never present a place here where the world comes in and feels so comfortable that they'll never change and they'll never be saved. And again, the gospel is not something that people want, but it's what they need. Amen. That is what is going to convert them. The message that you're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay is not the gospel, friend. Um, and the scripture, of course, shows to us that we need a commitment. The world doesn't like the idea that they have to give up their life for Christ, but the Bible teaches that, Romans chapter 12. And you know the many verses about bearing your cross and following Jesus. That's not a message that's being followed today or being preached. Romans chapter 12 is pretty clear about this, that a call to Christ and a call to salvation is not just pray Jesus loves me and this I know for the Bible tells me so and I'm on my way to heaven and then live my life how I want. The Bible preaches repentance. Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Huh. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Now we're after the will of man. If I say to you today, God has a different plan for your life than you do, and you have to be willing to submit to His plan, I'm preaching something that's very uncomfortable to people. Not you, I know. But even anyone, of course, that is a fleshly person, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Go back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 today. Jeremiah chapter 10 today. And it says there in verse number 1 and 2, Hear ye the word which the Lord has spoken unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Biblical principles are not to be based on business marketing. And churches are doing that. They're figuring out just how to grow the church just like a business would be grown, marketing to the people what they want so that they will respond and will come and the church will grow. Again, God said preach the word. The word. Amen? It's not always a message that's palatable. And the churches today are doing just about everything they can. Um, new, spectacular, whatever it is, we're going to do it. We'll, we'll do it. Um, and... You know, I've often said here, we're not against having a good time as a church, but God help us when entertainment takes the place of the Word of God. We are to be a training church, a teaching church, and not an entertaining church. Amen. Um, one thing you'll never have is I'm your pastor as a comedian. It's a very common thing to be known. I am not a good joke teller. Amen. But uh, by God's grace, I hope to continue. Pragmatism, what does that mean? Pragmatism. Pragmatism is as long as it turns out okay, or if the results are good, then therefore everything you did to get those results are right. We are to have the attitude to be all things to all men, but the Bible does not give us that verse to say that we should be drinking the beers in the bars so that we can win the lost man to Christ. The Bible does not say we're to go take a, have a rock concert so that people who enjoy rock music could come into the church and be saved or converted. That is not what the Bible tells us, but rather we're to be separate from the world. Amen? And we're to be different. So, and, I, and I've heard it, and it even is in Baptist churches. People will say, well, as long as somebody got saved, we did the right thing. Moses hit the rock twice, if you remember, in the Word of God. And the Bible says that God told him, speak to the rock. Do you remember that? And Moses' wrath was kindled against the people of Israel. 
And he got so mad at him that he struck the rock and he said, there's your water. Now quit your complaining. And the Bible says that because of Moses' sin and Moses' uh if you would, self-will at that time in his life, the Bible says it went ill with him because of the people of Israel. What does that mean? It means Moses did the wrong thing. And God told him, he said, because thou did not sanctify me among the people like I told you to do, you will not go in and see the promised land. That's in the Bible. So people have this idea, well, you know, the water came out, so Moses did the wrong thing, or did the right thing. No, he did not. Moses did the wrong thing, and God called it sin. So just because there's results does not mean we're doing the right thing. Can you say that with me? Can you get that in your mind? Do not look at things like the world looks at it. Do not look at the end to justify the means. Um, George Barna, if you know who he is, was uh, great in numbers and figures. And one of the things that he did is uh, actually made this statement. In the 80s, he said one of the uh, my contention based upon careful study of data and the activities of American churches is the number one problem plaguing the church is its failure to embrace a marketing orientation in what has become a market-driven environment. What was he saying? Just figure out how to get the people in and then you'll have a big church. That's what it's all about. Friend, the truth is the way to get people into the church, which is the saved of God, is to preach to them the gospel. You want to get somebody in this church, you want to see this church grow, go out there and share the gospel with somebody, win them to Christ, and they'll come in here and say, I am part of the saved. That's what the church is. Amen. So God help us to not uh, be in that point where we want to just be involved and in doing all of these things to just try to market people, to try to deal with their felt needs, to make them feel comfortable but rather let us be the people of God. When we come into this place, let it be our goal to please God, not to please man. Let it be that we could say, Lord, would you come into this place? Guys, I got news for you. The reason those churches, many of them are doing all of these great activities, I'm going to tell you why, because God's not there. God's not there. And if you got rid of all those activities, you're going to find out God's not working there. Sometimes it just is an outward thing that's being shown and, and there's results. But many of those people are not coming to Christ again. And if you get them around sound preaching and begin to preach the word of God, instant in season, out of season, all of a sudden they go, whoa, what is this? This isn't what I thought church was all about. And out they go. I got guys, guys, listen, I got I work with a man who was part of that large church over there. The Living Word, I believe I want to say. Living Word, he attended that church for a long period of time. And I'm talking to him. And I'm, I mean, he went there for a long, long time. And I'm talking to him. He's lost. He's on his way to hell. He's not even believing that God exists. And he went to that church for a long period of time. You know why? Because there was nothing there that was truth that could bring him to Christ, that could change his life. That as the one lady said here many weeks ago, there was no difference between the lost and the saved. There was no difference between light and darkness. And there was no tr difference between truth and lies. It was all just a nice, general, feel-good, inspirational, entertaining, rock concert type of a way. And um, I, ha <laughs> I had a, a customer here a couple weeks ago, and he talked to me about one of these big mega churches that he's attending and how great they're doing. And listen, I hope... In all of that, someone is getting saved. I do. I pray. And I believe that people are getting saved in spite of people doing wrong and uh, all of this entertainment. I, I do believe that. But still, if you think about this today, there's no right way to do a wrong thing. Please remember that. Let's not base our church decisions on will it grow our church? Will it appeal to the lost? Will those on the outside feel comfortable when they come to the inside? But rather, is this place pleasing to the Lord? And what we're doing, is that pleasing to the Lord? And then let God take care of those results. Amen. The Bible says God will yield the increase. He'll give to us what He wants in this place if we do what He wants us to do in this place. Any comments here as we come to the end of this today? Salesmanship versus the Spirit of God. 
Yes, sir. Let's pray. Father, help us to be faithful here in this place. Help us, Lord, to do the things that you ask us to do. And yes, we do care for people. We do want to see people saved. We do want to see our church grow. But Lord, help us to never sacrifice what we know to be right and to undermine the things that you have placed in your word as boundaries for a life that is to be honoring and pleasing to you. Uh, Lord, for the conviction that we need, Lord, through the preaching and through even how what we say and what we live, Lord, help us to acknowledge you in all of our ways, as the scripture said, be not wise in our own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. Help us to have that mindset as a church. And Lord, we will expect and know that you will bring forth as the scripture says in Acts chapter 2, when they continued steadfastly in that Bible, in the apostles' doctrine, you added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's leave the uh, results up to you. But Lord, help us to be faithful, of course, to be part of that work of winning the loss to Christ, telling people of Jesus, passing out tracts, doing what we can to uh, get the word of God out that sinners might be saved. And then, then they might come to this church and Lord, if a sinner is invited and they come into this place, of course, may we be faithful to preach the word of God and tell them what they need to hear and not just what they want to hear. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.